induction of students into Zeta Cairo, the academic honorary for the college's academic major in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, which offers the only undergraduate major in HGS in the nation. We begin tonight by remembering the work of a special group of students who risked their lives to make a difference with and through their study and witness. The White Rose was the code name for a clandestine group of students and their supportive teacher from the University of Potomac, who organized themselves to, prote to protest activities and policies of the Third Reich, including those directed against Jews. With the placing of a white rose on the podium here, and the white roses worn by the recipients of the Herman Awards, we remember their witness and remind ourselves that the work of students and their mentors indeed makes a difference that counts. A difference that counted then and a difference that counts now. The Susan J. Herman Awards honors individuals in our community who have demonstrated significant contributions in, promoted holo in promoting Holocaust education and genocide awareness, cultivating the responsible stewardship of what Emmanuel Levinas called the difficult freedom of living in a world marked by Holocaust and genocide. More specifically, we honor recipients in two categories, for student leadership and for leadership in and with our extended community. The award was established in 2010 to honor the work and inspiration of the late Susan J. Herman. It recognizes individuals like Susan who make good things happen as they work to rid the world of genocidal hatred. Through personal leadership and meaningful action, they stimulate greater understanding of genocide, pursue increased activism on behalf of the victims of crimes against humanity, or inspire community engagement in educating people about genocide, both historically and with regard to the Holocaust and other genocides, as well as contemporaneously with regard to the spiral of violence stalking the world in which you and I live. Our student award is given to three students. This year, Catherine Marin, Charlotte Myers, and Tanner Simmelrock. They have been actively engaged in making good things happen for several years, developing programs on campus, supporting statewide and national legislation, organizing community action opportunities, and as you will soon hear, coordinating their efforts with each other to multiply the impact of what each of their own voices can do. Our two community recipients have likewise had long-term impacts in and with their work in their communities. Kathy Preston, a Cohen Fellow from Center Barnstead, New Hampshire, is a frequent speaker for the Cohen Center, but her work of witness extends beyond the programming boundaries of the Cohen Center. Kathy speaks frequently in middle and high schools in the region, telling her story of rescue and survival. Indeed, she has been sharing her story as a child survivor of the Holocaust for a considerable time and with far-reaching impact. Her story is now available in her newly published book, Holocaust to Healing, Closing the Circle. It looks like this. <laughs> and just before the evening began, I asked Kathy to make my book work even better by signing it. There are copies available in the Harry Davis room if you want to have your book work better for that same reason. Our second community recipient is Professor Helen Fine, 
a founding scholar in the fields of Holocaust and genocide studies from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Helen's work is familiar to students of Holocaust and genocide studies worldwide, as well as here at Keene State. Indeed, we at Keene State College were privileged to receive Professor Fine's personal library in Holocaust and Genocide Studies this past January. Her books are being cataloged and will soon be added to the Cohen Center's Charles and Judith Hildebrandt collection that can be accessed on the east wing of the first floor of Mason Library. Selected copies of Professor Fine's own works are on display for the uh, in the Harry Davis Room. We invite you to look at them after the ceremony before you leave. Each of our honorees has shown us what one dedicated voice can do, alone and in concert. In recognition of their witness, we have asked them to join in our tradition of reflecting on the power of their witness by addressing the theme, what one voice can do. For health reasons, Dr. Fine is unable to join us. However, her close friend, Dr. Joyce Absel, president of the Institute for the Study of Genocide and master teacher in the liberal arts program of New York University, has sent us a letter with observations that will help us understand the power of Helen Fine's voice. After hearing some of her reflections on Helen's voice, we will hear then from Kathy Preston. Then following Kathy, we will turn to Charlotte Myers, Tanner Semmelrock, and then Catherine Marin, who will speak to you in their distinctive voices, yet together demonstrating one of the reasons they are sharing the Susan Herman Award this year. from Joyce Absel. To members of the Keene State College community, this is a very special occasion, recognizing the scholarly and advocacy work in the fields of genocide and Holocaust studies carried out for decades by historical sociologist, Dr. Helen Fine, and awarding Dr. Fine the Susan Herman Award for Leadership in Holocaust and Genocide Awareness by the Cohen Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. I wish that I was able to be there in person for this event, but I am very much there in spirit. I wanted to convey some of my reflections about Helen Fine as a scholar and her landmark, her landmark work in the area of genocide studies and as a colleague for over three decades in the not-for-profit institute for the study of genocide. Helen Fine has been an influential scholar, a pioneer in genocide studies as a scholar and occasionally as one of the co-founders and first president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars and has researched, written about, and been a human rights advocate for over four decades. Her landmark work, Accounting for Genocide, received the American Sociological Association Sorokin Award and was cited as the most important social scientific work since Hilberg's The Destruction of European Jewry. As pointed out in the Sorokin Award citation, the work was a, quote, brilliantly original interpretation of, a, of complex and singular ev processes that have until now defied comprehensive social analysis. Helen Fine's originality was reflected in this book through, for example, one, using Raphael Lemkin's definition of the term genocide to analyze the Holocaust, and two, introducing the frame of genocide as a term and legal norm to a larger academic and public audience, Two, in, including a comparative frame inciting the history of the Armenian genocide. And three, in applying historical sociological analysis to examining targeted violence with a rigorous sociological methodology that had not been applied before. 
this rigorous application of historical sociology would continue in a series of important books, monographs, and articles over the next decades. These ranged from Is the Holocaust Unique to Defying Genocide from Armenia to Bosnia to Discriminating Genocide from War Crimes, Vietnam and Afghanistan to Political Functions of Genocide Comparisons and then to her 2007 volume, Human Rights and Wrongs, Slavery, Terror, and Genocide. Helen Fine's work illustrates repeatedly originality, her training as a historical sociologist and deep commitment to humanistic scholarship. Beside Helen Fine's pioneering and sustained original scholarship, she has raised Holocaust and genocide awareness through her work as the executive director of the not-for-profit Institute for Genocide for over 25 years and continues to work with the Institute serving as chair of the board. The Institute for the Study of Genocide is one of the oldest nonprofits in the world. Now, believe it or not, I've only read a small section of Joyce Apsel's letter, but this will do. Helen, this award is for you. We wish you could join us in person, but through the power of digital technology, we record this moment for you and express our gratitude for your steady labors on behalf of Holocaust education and genocide awareness. We are all in your debt and very much aware of what your voice has done. You have made, and this is Helen's phrase, our universe of moral obligation bigger and certainly more informed. Helen, we thank you, and would you join me in expressing that gratitude with your applause. Kathy Preston, would you please come forward? Thank you. you too make our world bigger and richer. And louder. <laughs> <laughs> please accept this award as our way of saying thank you for your work and for t participating in a partnership with us as we forge our witness to the world beyond Keene State. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Your hands for it, can oh, you? Okay. Now you know who I am, so I don't have to introduce myself. <laughs> Basically, what I would like to do is tell you how much I love this place. I love the Cohen Center and, and the people therein. It's a few years ago that I was asked to come and meet some of the people, and I have fallen in love with this whole area and the whole, the whole student body and the professors here because these are all people who are doing this for the good of everybody. These are not people who are studying or lecturing for money. They're doing it because they really, really care about humanity. And I'm a child survivor from the Holocaust. I was actually rescued by a simple Hungarian peasant girl called Erzsébet, which is Elizabeth in Hungarian. And she took me through great peril to her farm and hid me in an attic because I was supposed to die. I was, I was half Jewish. I wasn't even completely Jewish, but I was slated to die because even if you had one grandparent who was Jewish, you were supposed to die. And I had a father who was Jewish. My father and his whole family were exterminated, and I survived because of this woman who hid me. 
And when they came to look for me, she didn't tell them where I was hidden. They were slapping her around. And she told me to hide under the hay, under the eaves. And I crawled under the eaves. I was five years old. And she said to me, you make yourself small. You don't breathe. You don't, you don't exist because they'll kill you. And so I hid under the hay. And three Hungarian soldiers, mind you, I never met a German Nazi, with black feathers in their hat, came up to the attic. And they were poking bayonets in the hay. And one of them landed right near my face. And as he pulled it out of the wood, I remember the twang it made. And that day, I realized what it means, the possibility of dying. Because dying is not a normal thing for a child to contemplate. And I spent my whole life as a survivor being a nasty little overachiever because I felt I had to really make a difference. And as I got older, I suddenly realized that I have a better role now. And perhaps because the others tend to be dead, I've become very popular. And so I go around and I speak to whoever will listen to me. I speak mainly in middle schools because I love the, the half angel, half devils in those children. <laughs> and I then speak in high schools, I speak in colleges, churches, synagogues, anywhere. I even spoke at a Masonic uh, temple, which was kind of strange, but anyway. But what I'm trying to say is that it took me 50 years to stop hating. Because as a child, I was so full of hatred when I found out how my poor father was murdered, because I knew the details. Uh, I, it was, my, my, my soul was so full of hatred, there was no room for anything else. And over the years, I managed to divest myself of the hatred. And now, although I still have sorrow, Instead of hatred, I have love. And I find that when I talk to people and I talk with love and I explain to these people and the children especially that, you know, the Holocaust is bullying on steroids and be very careful what you do every single day. And it is the power of each one of you to make a difference. And you guys are amazing. The mere fact that you are taking this as, as a major is already a big testament to your characters. And I, I thank everybody in this college because it's, you know, the genocide and the Holocaust is not just a Jewish tragedy, it's a human tragedy. It's not my Holocaust, it's everybody's Holocaust, it's the world's Holocaust, and it's still going on. So please reach out as much as you can, and I will keep talking until they shut me up. And it's not easy, <laughs> but what, what I'm trying to say is that have the courage to talk because there are good people out there. There's good, good souls, good hearts. And today in this awful political tendency to have hate speech again, there's echoes of what went on. Don't let it take your country away from you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and have been integral parts of passing genocide awareness leg legislation on the state level as well as the national level. We have had countless late night phone calls, email chains, and group texts, including conference calls between all three of us while we have been in three different states in order to solve problems and figure out as a team how to accomplish a task. Those of you, those of you who know me know that I am the last person to stand up here and talk about my achievements as well as our own and draw attention to our, my achievements and well as our achievements and draw attention to myself in that way. That is not how I am comfortable using my one voice and that is certainly not the point of this speech. What is important is that all of our achievements would not have occurred without our ability to rely on each other so heavily throughout our time in this major. The three of us came to Keene State College as individuals from all different places and backgrounds with the same passion to study this challenging topic and the drive to make a difference while inspiring others. We have gone through a series of transformations over the years from those three individual freshmen with only one voice each to voices building off of each other in our courses and on campus and finally to a team of three united voices who will always rely on each other and speak as one voice in order to build, inspire, and make good things happen. <clears throat> Through the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Department and the Cohen Center, Charlotte, Catherine, and I were able to foster a relationship that will last a lifetime, and we're able to leave a mark on Keene that will last a lifetime, or until they take the plaque off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> The time spent with one another has brought three separate voices together to the point where we can now act as one solidified voice. Albeit there might be times where they think, wait, did he really just say that? Awkward. <laughs> but our true collective voices have been and will continue to be a united voice for action, change, and even the occasional celebration. The best example of our united voice is the genocide and awareness prevention legislation that Charlotte and Catherine helped pass in New Hampshire. The work they did inspired me to want to pass something similar in my home state of Connecticut. Six months down the line, Charlotte and Catherine played an integral, integ integral role in seeing that the legislation passed uh, the governance committee and is up for a vote in the Connecticut Senate. Someone once said, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. Charlotte and Catherine casted as what I see, a boulder, when they helped pass the legislation in New Hampshire, and their ripples have inspired me and many others to follow in their footsteps. There is a unique challenge in asking three people what the power of one voice can do. For Tanner, Charlotte, and myself, a voice can mean many different things. Throughout our four years in the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Department, our voices have changed, been strengthened, and grown together. For we each have strong voices, but we have learned to never let those voices stand alone. One voice can only be heard so far. One voice can only reach so many people. One voice can only impact and inspire so many. A voice grows in power only when it's joined by more voices, or in our case, when three voices work to become one much stronger and more impactful voice. One voice can inspire someone or support someone or help someone. Three voices have the power to do all of those things and more. On behalf of Charlotte and Tanner, I would like to thank our family and friends for their love and support. Our fellow students in the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Department for always inspiring us and being a source of constant encouragement. And to our professors and the staff of the Cohen Center for helping us find our voices. We'd especially like to thank Michelle Kiawa for creating a space to let our voices grow and for always being in our corner cheering us on. Thank you. Before we present and honor the recipients of the Hildebrand Awards, we want to induct new members 
of Zeta Chi Rho, the alpha or founding chapter of the Student Honorary for Excellence in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Though not by a direct relationship, the Greek letter Zeta Chi Rho evoke the sound of the Hebrew letters, Zion, Kaf, and Remes, that form the root of the word Zachor, which means remember. Charlotte Myers is president of Zeta Chi Rho, and Tanner Simmelrock is vice president, will induct our new members in recognition of the excellence of their work in Holocaust and genocide studies at Keene State College. Zeta Chi Rho and its Alpha Chapter, both founded at Keene State College in 2009, exist to recognize superior academic work in the field of Holocaust and Genocide Studies and to promote in-depth study of the Holocaust and Genocide through research and the healthy exchange of ideas and scholarship. The purpose of Zeta Chi Rho is to maintain and operate a Holocaust and Genocide Studies Honor Society at Keene State College, coordinate with other Holocaust and or Holocaust and Genocide Studies Honor Society chapters, programs, and organizations, to coordinate the organization of Zeta Chi Rho seminars, conferences, research, discussion groups, study groups, and publications, and to, spo and to sponsor a Zeta Chi Rho publication that promotes academic excellence at the undergraduate level in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Zeta Chi Rho was a name derived from the Hebrew term Zahor, meaning to remember. Tonight, our four new inductees will each be receiving a pin with the Hebrew Zahor as a constant reminder of our responsibility to remember. Tanner, Tanner and I are honored to welcome four outstanding students into Zeta Chi Rho. Jewel Bean. Nathaniel Wolf. <laughs> Alyssa DeMarco. <laughs> and Dylan Runner. One last round of applause for our four new members. The Hildebrand Award honors Keene State College Professor Emeritus in Sociology and the founder of the Center for Holocaust Studies, Charles A. Hildebrand. It is given in recognition of excellence in Holocaust and genocide studies. Students and members of the extended Keene community submit essays, historical analyses, stories, poems, musical compositions, dance, film, projects in theater and visual arts exploring and expressing their own personal relationship to or reflections on the Holocaust and genocide. This year's awards were selected by a jury of community volunteers chaired by Tom White, the Cohen Center's coordinator of educational outreach. As Tom reminds me, that means CEO. They included Cohen Fellows Vicki Pittman, Director of Education and Community Engagement from the Colonial Theater, John Sturtz, Assistant Professor of Education at Keene State College, and Linda Manichiello, an English teacher at Mandadnock Regional High School, who, by the way, recused herself from the middle school category altogether since she was a mother of a participating student in that category. Tom, would you join me? to present our awards. 
The first award celebrates outstanding work from the community in the middle school category. This year's award recognizes Alex Manichiello of St. Joseph Regional School for his short story, Chocolaterie de Martin, and Naomi Nunez of Daisy Bronson Middle School, who receives an honorary mention for her poem, Beyond the Rose Field. We invite Naomi and then Alex to share glimpses of their work with us. If you two would come join us. everyone. I'm not really used to this, but um, the reason behind why I wrote Beyond the Rose Field was to almost like remind myself as to why something like the Holocaust or just genocide in general should never happen and why we should always remember why it's just never. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, this is just really emotional for me. It's, it's sometimes really hard for me to express my, my emotions, how I feel for something such as the Holocaust. And the dream that I had was the reason why I called it Beyond the Rose Field. I was a sister of this little boy, and it was during the World War II, of course, and I told him whenever things got too dangerous, we would go to this rose field where we'd be safe. And he ended up dying in a bomb. And I actually was the one who was saved going to the rose field. Beyond the tears, as a new day approaches, it's promising agony and fear. Beyond the tears already shed, by broken men and women and children, robbed of their humanity, their life. What more is for them and why? I've seen their dark, swollen faces, the light in their vibrant eyes, gone. These eyes and souls, once housed to use, used to house love, compassion, humbleness, obedience towards others. It soon diminished by a ravaging swarm of evil yet they did nothing to receive it. Beatings, shootings, hunger, until you could see every single bone in their body. Torture, yet they still endured and said nothing. But why? I saw as they were all forcibly pushed into the small box cart, many crying and wailing like children looking for their mother. Juden Schwein, Negroes, they called them, mocking their entire being looking at them with pure frigid eyes, believing they were pigs after all, ready to be slaughtered, having no sense of reason to exist, to be a part of life. These people who once lived freely were in bondage. As many tight, clammy, crammed days passed for them in these carts, it turned into a game for the pre-inmates, a game awaiting their death. You could smell the stench of feces, urine and blood even before opening these carts to set them off to work. Our bite macht frei, would work really set them free? Thank you. Last year when I was here to read a poem written by my brother, um, Dr. Knight asked me whether I would be next to enter a uh, work of art or a work of a uh, story to, uh, to the Hildebrandt. So I recall being really surprised by his offer, so I worked on a submission for this year. I was inspired by a book I skimmed while browsing in a Boston bookshop. The story was about Norwegian children who smuggled gold away from the Nazis on their sleds. This got me thinking about a story of my own that would feature an elderly Belgian couple would also hide something from the Nazis. That something would be children, not gold. 
My story is called Chocolaterie de Martin, and I chose one excerpt for tonight. One thing I know about the Holocaust is that they were individual people who did great things to help others. Monsieur and Madame Martin were able to do what their hearts told them to do, even though they may have been terrified to do so. The clock tower told nine. In their apartment above the chocolaterie, the Martins sat side by side. Emile dozed over a book, his breathing long and peaceful. In the chair beside him, Eva sat with her, knit, with her half finished, finished knitting spread across her lap. The tranquility of the night was shattered by the sound of splintering wood. Voices resounded from the shop below, and footsteps pounded on the narrow wooden staircase to the apartment. Terrified, Eva looked at Emile, who stood as the Gestapo flooded their home. The hour is late. What is the meaning of this? Emile demanded. The clicking of Eva's knitting needles abruptly stopped. A voice Emile knew well but despised said, Come now, Emile. We know why we've, you know why we've come. You're hiding Jewish children. I saw you after dark in the street helping those miserable wretches. Where are they? There are no children here, Emile said calmly. Monsieur Bestin pointed his finger at Emile. By the time the Gestapo is done searching this house, you and those children will be marched off together and good riddance. Emile's hands tightened into fists at his side as the intruders raided the shop below in every, in every room of the small apartment. Eva did not move. From the kitchen, he could hear pots and pans clattering loudly to the floor, the scraping of tables being moved, and the opening and closing of cabinets and cupboards. In the apartment, the Gestapo emptied drawers, opened closets, moved furniture, rolled rugs, and stamped on the floorboards, listening for hollow ground. Monsieur Bastin followed the Gestapo from room to room, suggesting places he suspected the children might hide. With each passing moment, it appeared more flustered when it became obvious that there were no children to be found. <coughs> Where are they? Bram Schmidt strode into the room, his face red with anger. Enraged, he blustered. Where are they? Emile opened his mouth to speak, but Schmidt shoved him roughly down into the chair. Eva sat word wordless and made no move to protest. A voice from below called up the stairs. No children here. Schmidt glanced at the men who had searched the apartment, but found nothing. We know Bastin, you know, we know Monsieur Bastin to be a trustworthy man. Arrest them. That will not be necessary, said a dignified voice in the hallway. What will you arrest them for? Children that cannot be find, found? There, there is no need to disturb the Martins any further. They are far too old to have taken sides in this matter. Bastin, your eyes have deceived you. Show him out. Bastin sputtered as he was led down the stairs. Soon the apartment was empty except for Emile, Eva, and Rolguste. I am pleased that we found no children. It would have been a shame to have brought the ruin to the best chocolatier in Belgium. Gus clasped his hand behind his back and circled the couple as they sat in their chairs. Stopping at the window, he pushed aside the sheer curtain, glanced out into the street, and appeared to be thinking. He turned and looked at the Martins. I regret, I regret the untidiness of your home, but it was necessary, you understand, I'm sure. I shall take my leave and allow you to return to your book, Monsieur Martin, and you to your knitting, Madame. With that, Gus left the couple alone, and for many minutes they did not move or speak. Emil rose from the chair and made his way down to the stairs, to the shop and kitchen. In a few minutes, he returned to the apartment and said, They have gone. We are alone. Shoulders slumped. He turned, he turned toward Eva. Tears were streaming down her face. What is it, Eva? What is it? Emil asked her tenderly. With shaking hands, Eva lifted the knitting from her lap, revealing a small wooden doll dressed in pink and well-loved. Overcome, Emil placed his head in his hands and with a light heart wept. Thank you. The next award recognizes the work of community member Roberta Visser. For her poem entitled Lodged, Roberta, would you join us to receive your award, then to share your poem with us? Hi, everyone. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. 
So this poem is in three parts, and it's entitled Lodged. It was written to Leningrad Symphony No. 7 in C major by Dmitry Shostakovich and Charterhouse Suite and Symphony No. 3, Pastoral, by Ralph Vaughan Williams. Germany, 1930s. Behind the bustling streets, a background pulse. Home, hanging his coat, the warmth of his wife greeting him, a tasty meal on the table. Calm conversation, the sweetness of sipped tea with dense cake. Another day, clerks, customers, questions, money in and out, the tellers behind their iron cages. The sky darkens, flurries fall. People rush through the marble-walled bank without a word. He lifts his collar, looks straight ahead, sees no path through the lighted streets, now just concrete and poles. His wife's face pale, to whose young son no mention. Papers submitted. To whom could he confide? Waiting. One day turns into the air pulses. Crowds, brown-shirted soldiers, scrawl yud in dripping white on the dark bank door. Fling papers wild-eyed out windows, drifting destruction. In the forest. Always the looming, birds call with single notes, wet leaves, a platform over mud that line the insole of his boots, seep between his, tud, his toes. So intense the fatigue, the unknowing, river water rushing over rocks, once majestic, now a cruel impediment to reaching the other side. He, his wife, his son, like puppets with smashed faces, Feelings diffuse as rising steam, unable to be voiced. A bit of sweet potato at a farmhouse, the farm wife's quick, shifting movements. Eyes questioning compassion, always in silence. How quickly hope springs. A bed of straw on the barn loft, a day or a few. Somewhere on another plane, is there a known? trudging in emptiness of branches snapping underfoot, watching his wife and child wasting without food. He begs, let them go, not to a God he isn't sure exists, but almost to the soul of his son, his wife, as if asking angels out of their kindness to lift and care for them. The sun, oblivious, still streams at an angle through the trees. The round face of the full moon. What naive madness to have once spoken to its soft luminosity. Gazes with no cognition. He imagines the sad face of his long dead father. Oh, to receive a sign. In old age. The memories lodged in his stooped body, twisting, hissing like an open mouthed snake waiting to pounce. Sickness doctors can't diagnose, can't heal, because they didn't witness how he lived among the dark and damp. His belly gnawed by fear, the fatigue of carrying a child, the anguish of his wife. Circumstances the neurons were never conditioned to contemplate. How he had to flee without being betrayed, little to take, nowhere to go. Rush in darkness in silence. Thank you. The Keene State College Hildebrand Awards are shared by Samantha Bro and Emily Robinson with an honorary mention awarded to Liam McGann. Samantha, or Sam as we know her, is being recognized for a paper she prepared for her course on the Armenian Genocide, Barbarians of Hollywood, the Exploitation of Aurora Martaganian by the American Film Industry. Emily's work, Scavenger Hunt, 
was a project for her seminar, Rethinking the Holocaust, and then adapted for inclusion in the 2015 Summer Institute on the Holocaust and Genocide for Teachers and Community Leaders. Liam's project, When the Rainbow Breaks, Life After Trauma, also grew out of the seminar Rethinking the Holocaust. If they will come forward, first we will hear from Liam, then Sam will provide commentary on her paper, and then Emily will conclude with a description of her project. Liam? I apologize in advance. My voice sounds like this. <laughs> Untimely cold. <clears throat> okay. In the fall of 2014, while sitting in my Holocaust and Genocide 495 seminar, Rethinking the Holocaust, and reading the syllabus for the first time, I knew right away that the class would change me. We were required to lead a seminar session during the semester. As I read through the list of topics, one in particular stood out to me, representing trauma, coming to terms with trauma, a returning dilemma. I knew without a doubt that it would be the one I wanted to choose. <clears throat> Throughout the semester, I participated in class discussions about the Holocaust and trauma while holding on to a secret that I hadn't shared with many people. In the weeks leading up to the seminar session that I selected, we discussed the before and after of trauma. In my notebook, I jotted down ideas to write in my reflection post after class. The idea of a before and after, their before and after, my own before and after. It was that night that I revealed to the class via my Blackboard post that I had viewed everything we talked about through a lens of trauma because I had been raped when I was 15. I understood the Holocaust in a different way than others because of my knowledge of trauma and what it is like to live with a before and an after. As I began planning the seminar session about trauma, I knew that I wanted to approach it in a different way than everyone else had. For the most part, we had discussed the readings based on questions my other classmates had created or read passages together, followed by discussions in small groups. I knew that I wanted to bring something entirely new to the seminar. At strategic times during the course, Dr. Hank Knight would show us paintings by Samuel Bach as representations of Holocaust trauma. The idea of analyzing paintings instead of passages sparked my interest. After meeting with Dr. Knight in preparation for the seminar session, I would lead. <coughs> I selected two paintings from Bach's collection entitled Cups. I chose these paintings specifically because they resonated with me. When I looked at them, I saw an accurate depiction of what trauma was for me. I hoped that by having the class interpret them, I could share my perspectives and gain different ones outside of my lens of trauma. For the seminar session I led about trauma, I had the class spend 10 minutes first looking at the painting entitled Stages. <coughs> then I had them spend another 10 minutes looking at the painting entitled Familiar. Uh, they were told to write down how it made them feel, what they saw, anything that came to mind. Together, the 13 of us sat in silence as we viewed the paintings. I'll read a small excerpt of what I wrote about the first painting. I see this as stages of dealing with the trauma. The first cup, you are just drowning in it and can't get out. It surrounds you. It truly feels like you are drowning in it. The second cup is the stage where you are dealing with it and it's still surrounding you, but you have more good days than bad days. The final cup is overcoming. You're on top of it, can handle it, but I see it as thin ice. You can easily fall back into the second or first stage. After this exercise, I asked the class to split into groups of four and talk about what they had written down. I sat back and listened to each discuss the paintings for about 20 minutes. We brought it back together as a group and I asked questions specifically geared towards each painting. <coughs> for stages, I asked what they thought the significance of directions he faces was and what the water represented. I asked this question because they wanted to know what others saw when they first looked at the painting. For me, I immediately saw a depiction of dealing with trauma in stages. Someone brought up that they saw the painting as a perpetrator coming to terms with what he'd done, and that the first stage was the cup where the man was on top of the water, slowly sinking into the trauma of what he'd done. It was good for me to see different points of view other than one from simply a traumatized perspective. Too often trauma had clouded my vision of the discussions we had, and so I was able to see the paintings in a new way. 
for familiar, I asked the class what the cup represented. Again, I wanted to know what others saw when they viewed the painting. I hoped to gain a new perspective as well as have others gain one too. The answers varied from the world to his home to trauma. To wrap up the discussion, I asked two questions to evoke self-reflection. What was difficult for you? Has your understanding of trauma changed? A few of my classmates had previously expressed their struggles with interpreting box paintings, but felt that our in-depth process had helped them to better understand. Joining us that night was friend and colleague of Dr. Knight, Gary Phillips, the Edgar H. Ed Evans Professor of Religion at Wabash College, Indiana. Like Dr. Knight, Professor Phillips has studied and written about box paintings and the role in representing the Holocaust. He gave a lot of good insight and prompted the class to think deeper. As I look back now, a year and a half after presenting, that day still stands out in my mind. The positive reaction I received has led me to be more open about my perspective as a trauma-informed student. Prior to then, I had always silently carried my trauma within me and reflected on it on my own. <clears throat> I found that by talking about it with others as a way to understand the Holocaust, I began to understand it better myself. I learned how to live with trauma after trauma in a way that finally gave me leverage over it. For so long, it had been something that weighed me down each and every day. By sharing how it affected me and how it made me a trauma-informed student, I suddenly understood the benefits there were from trauma. In many ways, I have recovered who I am and become a stronger person as a result. The trauma is forever a part of me, but it no longer controls me. I have found a way to let trauma inform my life in the aftermath. It is always with me, but instead of weighing me down, it holds me up. In recent months, Dr. Knight and Professor Phillips asked my permission to use my story in a paper they are developing entitled, Fraught with Responsibility, Teaching the Holocaust with Insights from the Hermeneutics of Trauma, in which they discuss how students face the complexity of the trauma they study. After leading the seminar session and seeing how it impacted my classmates and how it impacted my healing as well, it has created a desire within me to share my story to help others. The significance of being represented in their work is beyond words. I had never understood the true impact of that night until I heard Dr. Knight explain how much it had struck both Professor Phillips and himself enough that they wanted to cite me as an example in their paper. Looking back on that very first class when I decided to select the topic, representing trauma, coming to terms with trauma, a returning dilemma, I had no idea it would lead me to where I am today. Considering the way I interpreted the Bach painting, stages, I would say that I'm firmly in the third stage. I am on top of the trauma and facing towards the future completely. Sam, would you come forward? Samantha Brobe, we invite you to accept your award and then give us a glimpse of your paper. Hello. A little short. <laughs> This research paper originated as an assignment for my Armenian Genocide course in the spring of 2015, taught by Alexis Herr. I chose my topic based on a lecture given by Dr. Lawrence Benequist. He spoke about a girl named Aurora Mardiganian, who was just 17 years old when she came to America in 1917, having survived the brutality of the genocide in the Ottoman Empire. He briefly recounted her survival, but discussed more her experience once she reached America. Shortly after her arrival, her new guardians helped to produce her translated bi autobiography. This caught the eye of an American filmmaker who adapted her story to the silent screen. The narratives through both mediums would commonly be known as ravished Armenia. It all seemed inspiring as any story about a survivor would be. However, I soon learned that there are many li hidden layers to the story. I was drawn in by the startling fact that only 20 minutes of the film are accounted for today. In an age where everything is accessible at the click of a button, how is it possible that the majority of the film is lost? My initial goal in researching her story was to answer this question. 
As I've said, this process began as an assignment. However, as my, pro my research progressed, the developments were significant. First, Mardiganian's story spoke to the role of humanitarian aid during and after World War I. These efforts further developed with the addition of film as a way to fundraise. In fact, the film Ravished Armenia was the first of its kind, giving the world an intense and graphic moving visual of what mass atrocities looked like in the Ottoman Empire. Sponsored by the Near East Relief, the film did yield considerable results. At $10 a ticket, it was already charging 10 times the average price. Near East Relief used Ravished Armenia as a tool to raise their goal of $30 million to those suffering in the Ottoman Empire. Overall, they were successful in raising awareness of the genocide. However, one thing became clearly apparent. This was that Marta Ganian was exploited by the many adults that she encountered upon her arrival at Ellis Island in the years following. One must understand her predicament. She was orphaned with no knowledge of American culture or the English language. She, what she had experienced from 1915 to 1917 is incomprehensible. She, was, she witnessed the murders of her mother and sister, as well as the massacres of her people. She renounced her Christian faith in an effort to save her life and withstood the trauma of repeated rape. And after escaping a violent harem, she traveled across the desertous region of Dursum to safety in the Russian-occupied city of Erzurum. From 1915 to 1917, she would have walked a total of 1,400 miles. Her assumptive world was shattered, and this left her vulnerable. This theme of exploitation was persistent. Marta Ganian was misled into playing herself in the film when she arrived in America, and made to act in scenes depicting the horrors that she once experienced firsthand. Much of the plot in Ravished Armenia also had the distinct markings of Hollywood fabrication and manipulation. The film was a shadow of the harsh reality that was the Armenian Genocide. By the end of the research, I was able to state one thing with absolute certainty, that Aurora Martiganian was exploited physically, psychologically, and financially in order to yield the maximum profit from the film and the autobiography. The film industry sensationalized the tragic events of her life and used their creative license to alter the reality of what happened. In this way, their wrongdoing impacted not only Martiganian, but knowledge of the genocide as a whole for decades. Researching the story of Aurora Martiganian was filled with a wide range of feelings and reactions. I was inspired by her determination to garner support for the Armenian people. I was deeply angered by the treatment that she was subjected to by the people she so desperately deserved compassion from. I was saddened by what I thought to be the end of her story as I found out that she passed away in 1994 with no one by her side and her story being forgotten for the better part of the 20th century. However, by presenting this research to Keene State College, I have a part in ensuring that her death is not the end of her story. In 1917, she bravely shared part of her soul with the world. This should not be in vain. Here she is given a voice, and we are able to properly remember and appreciate her invaluable narrative. Martiganian's story provides the world with an opportunity to learn from past mistakes. Her legacy highlights the need for remembrance over apathy and active awareness over indifference. Thank you. Emily, if you would join us to receive your award, Emily Robinson, and then describe your project for us. First of all, thank you, Michelle Kiawa. She keeps us running. Also, I just want to thank my mentors for this product project, uh, Dr. Knight and uh, John Sturtz, who I don't think is here, but that's all right. He's awesome. He gave me a crash course in lesson planning, which is a lot more fun than you'd think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is how binders work. Ah, I see. As educators or future educators, uh, it is important to recognize that we have influence over the narrative our students build of the Holocaust. 
The first contact many students have with the subject is through films that are based, however loosely, on its events or concepts. This means students enter the classroom with misconceptions about what the Holocaust is and what actually happened. However, despite their potential lack of fact or historical inaccuracies, it is my belief that we can, and to a certain extent we must, use these popular movies as learning tools. There can be truth beneath fiction, just as there can be fiction within fact. And by exploring the gray zone between the two, we can engage our students in not only con the content, but in the human lens of contradiction and interpretation. At its core, my project seeks to discover ways we can piece together a narrative of an unimaginable event in a responsible way while using popular fiction in tandem with factual representation. So that's part of it. I'll just scroll down a little bit. Just so you have something to look at. <clears throat> my project is a lesson plan for what I've called a scavenger hunt, as you can see. It explores Holocaust representation, responsibility, and trauma through the lenses of fact, fiction, and stylization. It started as, as Dr. Knight said. It was an assignment for his class called Rethinking the Holocaust in the fall of 2014, and then I was asked to replicate it again, which is what you're seeing up here for the Cohen Center Summer Institute in 2015 for about 20 teachers that uh, came to learn about how to teach the Holocaust. Um, so based on my experience presenting that, on both occasions, I, I turned it into this. So there you go. <laughs> the scavenger hunt takes three subject areas within the Holocaust and Gen Holocaust studies and examines and portrays them in three different ways, factual, fictionalized, stylized. The goal for each item is given is to identify the fact, the fiction, or how it is stylized, and how it either helps or hinders understanding and learning concerning the Holocaust. Each item is in the form of a URL link, uh, which means students utilize computers to access a wide breadth of websites related to Holocaust and genocide studies. Uh, it is aimed to enable students to engage in this difficult topic through a fun activity in the spirit of discovery, hence scavenger hunt. It is also designed to enable peer discussions to provide students with support while confronting a traumatic event. After completing the activity, the class comes together for a large group discussion to unpack findings and talk about how representing the Holocaust can be complicated. Who knew? <laughs> My hope is students will find the answers are not as black and white as they may have seemed. The group discussion is supposed to encourage students to think critically about the movies they have seen or will see and identify where they are useful and where they are limiting. The question of how we use a movie, a book, or a comic as a tool for learning about the Holocaust will always have its caveats. However, you never know what will connect someone to the labyrinthine puzzle of the Holocaust. Strictly knowing the facts does not necessarily build a picture of the extent of the trauma caused by the Holocaust. The assumptive worlds of victims and survivors were shattered, which is not something that can necessarily be shown by one discipline of study. The event was an interdisciplinary one, therefore learning about it has to be interdisciplinary as well. We should not be afraid to bring in pieces that seem to have no value and use them carefully to engage a wider breadth of students. The conversation Holocaust and Genocide Studies sparks is one that should continue as we engage with what it means to be a part of our local, national, and global communities. We need each other to talk about the worst we can do as humans. To assess where we are, we need to hear, where are you? My hope is that teachers who are tentative or unsure about, of how to use the Holocaust with students will use this lesson plan to begin the conversation that will help piece together the unimaginable. Thank you. To our many friends, especially our honorees this evening, thank you for your work, your commitment, your dedication. You inspire us and you give us hope. Indeed, you honor us. To all of you who have joined us for this evening, thank you for what you do. Together, we all make a difference. We ask you to set aside September 26 for next fall's annual Holocaust Memorial Lecture. Our lecture will be a unique undertaking combining music from Terezin or Theresienstadt and the witness of a very special individual, Ella Weisberger, a survivor of Theresienstadt 
and the young woman who portrayed the cat in the camp production of the children's opera, Brundibar. In addition to hearing Ella's amazing story, we will hear music composed in Theresienstadt, performed by visiting artists, coordinated by Keene State College's Department of Music. And more immediately, we invite you to put Sunday, May 8th on your calendars. I believe that three o'clock in the afternoon, Ahava Sahim will be hosting a public commemoration of Yom HaShoah. Again, thanks to all of you who have participated in this year's Hildebrand Awards. Samples of the work of our students are, um, well, I'm not sure that they're available for your perusal. We had hoped they would be. Uh, but what I encourage you to do is you've been given a sample. Come visit with the uh, award recipients and uh, let them know how you feel about what they have done. They have done amazing work. And we hope that uh, in addition to inspiring you to think seriously about these topics, those of you who will be back as students and community members available to submit things next year, start work now. You can do this too. Thank you again for coming and good night.